Okay. <clears throat> so um, last time we were talking about the sources of tradition, beginning with scripture, and then we went through a series of other um, written deposits of um, our our faith, of how we understand our faith, um, which included um, things like the liturgical texts of the church, uh, the the decisions of the councils, the writings of the church fathers, the lives of the saints, um, the canon laws, and the sacred arts of the church. So we went through that list of things. And um, we didn't really get into iconography, so I wanted to talk a little bit about iconography today before we uh, move on. Um, and so I'm going to just say a few things, but then I have um, something that I thought we could kind of uh, read through a little bit and that might be helpful for us. So um, we say that along with other written um, deposits or um, written accounts, we could say, of our faith, of the gospel, uh, we have iconography as an additional written account. Um, and so we actually say that icons are written. We, have, we use this language um, because they're, they present in a visual way what the words of scripture, for example, present in a literary way. Um, so in, we, we have the words of scripture describing everything that the Lord did in the gospel, but we have icons also portraying uh, with symbolism um, and art what took place in the gospel. So, <clears throat> and I think when we did the tour in the church, I talked about the icon of Christ. We, we talked about the meaning of some of the things, but I'll just mention again very briefly. Um, and I'll, I'll just hold this over here so it's kind of, you don't have to crane your necks to see it. Um, so, this icon of Christ is, um, you know, it's, it's unique, uh, it's a copy, but the original is unique in the sense that the iconographer, um, you know, had his particular style and there are particular features and coloring and everything like that that's unique to this icon. However, it follows a particular canonical form. So the, the symbolism of it, the way it's done, the, the sort of basic way that the, the face of Christ is portrayed, the way his hand is held, the, the, the colors of the clothing, although the shades may vary, but the basic colors, um, the way he's holding the, the book with words from the gospel and so on, all of that's standard. And so this is what we call um, the canons. The, the, this is from the canons of iconography that uh, sort of dictate how that's done. Why is that important, how, you know, how, that it's done in this particular way? Well, it's just like scripture. I mean, we say, if you're going to translate the scripture, you've got to try to be accurate, you know? And, it, and if it's a translation, like when we translate from Greek into English or from Hebrew into English, we would say, well, you know, the, the person who's translating is going to be making decisions about whether to use this word or a synonym or, you know what I mean, like to translate the, the Greek original or the Hebrew original into English. So you have decisions to make, and there's some artistic sensibility that goes into that, you know. For example, when you're translating the Psalms, you could just make it very, very literal and have it not be poetic at all. But then you're missing something because the Psalms were written as poems, you know, it's poetry. So it's supposed to be beautiful. So you have to take that into consideration. Well, likewise with icons, there is consideration for the aesthetics, but it also has to be accurate, you know. So that's why, you know, we have these particular canons that the iconographers follow. And so there are things that basically you can look at any Orthodox icon of Christ um, and like we have the ones in the church, the one on the iconostasis, um, the one that people come and kiss that's up on the front on the right side, um, just a little in front of the iconostasis. And they're all a little bit different, but you can recognize each one, that's Christ. You can see, yes, that's, that's Christ. And it helps that it actually says Jesus Christ. So if you know what that means, then you know that that is the Lord. But even if you couldn't say it was in some other language and you didn't know what that said, like you go to Georgia and it's in Georgian and their script is really wild, you know, it doesn't look anything like Greek or English. It's very different, but you would recognize that's the Lord. Um, so we have these kind of features. Now, keep in mind that while there are basic um, aesthetic 
uh, qualities and basic features that you see in any icon of Christ, the goal isn't to, um, to create this sort of realistic, uh, like photographic portrayal. That's not the goal. Um, the, the iconographer doesn't get caught up in, well, you know, does he look exactly like this or exactly like that? Because it's um, meant to be a theological statement uh, and not simply um, to, to be a, a sort of artistic rendering or, or something kind of photographic. Now, if we had had, if people had had photographs uh, 2,000 years ago, we certainly would have photographs of Christ, you know, um, just like uh, you have photographs of your family members in your house. You have portraits and, and things like that. Um, and so we say, um, and, and this touches on the sort of the use of iconography and also it's um, the fact that it's permissible and um, important in the life of the church. That if people had had photographs, they would have been taking photographs of the Lord and would have cherished those photographs. I mean, can you imagine otherwise if people had had cameras, all the Christians, you know, all the disciples, they'd be like shooting pictures all the time. And not just the disciples, but all the the paparazzi would be there too, right? You know, like the public when they're coming in, like, oh, he just did a miracle. You know, they're, they're trying to capture that and, and that kind of thing. Um, but the subsequent generations of Christians would have kept those and would have cherished them and, and handed them down. Well, they didn't, but they did have people who could paint. You know, um, and so we have by tradition Luke was the first iconographer, the Holy Apostle Luke. He was trained as a doctor, so he's a patron saint for doctors. But he was also trained as an artist. He was half Greek, half Greek, half Jewish. Um, so he had a you know a Greek name and and was culturally partly Greek. So um, he was trained in um, sort of the, the fine arts of the era. And so uh, by tradition. He painted the first icons that we know of, um, and he especially painted icons of the Virgin Mary holding Christ as a child. He knew her. He knew what she looked like. He spent time with her. You know, and, and think about this. Um, this is a little off topic, but in his gospel, Luke's gospel, has a lot more uh, details about the infancy of Christ and his, his birth and everything leading up to that. He was a doctor, and he knew how to ask questions, you know. He knew how to talk to the Theotokas and say, well, was it like this, or was it like this, you know. And he thought of things that maybe the other um, evangelists wouldn't have thought of. So he includes those details, but he also spent time with her, and he painted portraits of her, um, and of, the, of Christ as a child. Um, but the early generations of Christians also began painting um, images of the Lord um, as an adult, and... Um, and specifically, this was the form in which Christ was presented that became um, the most common canonical form. It's called Christ Pantocrator. So that means ruler of all. So he's presented as the Lord in glory, you know, he, as he will appear to us when he comes again in glory, you know, in the second coming. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and sometimes he's even portrayed as a king with a crown on his head and everything like that. But most often it's just like this. So he's still uh, humble in his appearance. You know, he's, he's in his human form um, because he became human. And he continues to be human even after his ascension into heaven. He, he kept his human nature. So he still is a human being. That's something eternal. Um, so we see him as a human being, but we see him also um, clearly uh, presented as the Lord of glory um, and you know with his hand blessing you and uh, holding uh, the the gospel book with a passage this one says you have not chosen me but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and uh, bring forth much fruit it doesn't have the rest it just says go and bring because they ran out of room but that's that's the passage you know so um, we have the symbolism of, uh, you know, this says uh, Jesus Christ, but then you have the O'on. And do you remember, I explained that in the church, but I'll just uh, mention again briefly. That's, that means um, the I am, or the existing one. Um, O'on in Greek is the existing one, which is telling us that he is the word of God who spoke out of the burning bush. When Moses had that encounter with the burning bush and the Lord said, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he said, who am I going to say sent me? And the Lord said, 
I am. I am, you know, I am that I am. I am the, the source of existence. You want to tell Pharaoh who I am? Tell him the source of existence sent you, you know? Basically, that's what he's saying. Well, the icons of Christ uh, have that on around his halo, um, and that's an incredible theological statement. So this is what I, one of the things that I mean. Like, if you took a photograph, you wouldn't see that, right? But this is telling us something. That it's not just that Jesus is a man, he's not just a good teacher, he's not just a prophet, like the Muslims say. He is the existing one, you know. He is the Son of God, he's the Word of God, he's the, the source, uh, the Creator. And we say, of course, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together create and sustain the world. And, and um, next time we'll talk more about uh, the Trinity and the relationship between the persons of the Trinity. And then, of course, um, we have the, there's the blue clothing and the red. And the blue and the red um, speak of the humanity and the divinity that are joined together in Christ. And then the, the, the blessing hand, he blesses us. And every time the priest or the bishop blesses, he does it in that way because he's blessing you in the name of Christ. Um, and, of course, he's the source. He's the, as the Word of God, he's the source of the words of the gospel. So that's why he's always holding the gospel. Um, sometimes he's holding a closed book, and uh, the symbolism of that is not only the gospel, but also the book of life that you read about, for example, in the book of Revelation. It talks about whether we're written in the book of life. So that's all part of it, too. And in the church, we have Christ on the right side and on the left is the icon of the Virgin Mary with Christ and these represent the first coming and the second coming right so this is your second coming icon which is also the image that in the traditional temple is in the dome because you have Christ the Pantocrator the ruler of all looking down as it were from heaven and blessing us um, and also embracing us because the dome represents that sort of embrace that heaven and earth are meeting together and God is um, raising us up as he embraces us. So, <clears throat> every icon, not only those of Christ, but also of um, the saints, but uh, many of them are also, of, uh, they portray scenes in the gospel, events that take place. And in a, a sort of traditional setup in a church, you'll have all the walls covered with iconography. And so they show you all these different scenes. And historically, if you go back a few generations, um, most people weren't literate. You know, the, the majority of people, if you go back centuries, um, or at least uh, you know a certain percentage of people, just were not literate. It might have been the upper classes who would have been able to learn how to read, and, but you know, a lot of the people, sort of, sort of the peasants, or you know, people who who simply didn't have the opportunity, they didn't learn how to read, um, and so. Icons serve the purpose of instructing those who didn't know how to read. They could look, and, and so the idea again was not just to sort of give a nice illustration, but to present something that would teach. And that's why the symbolism is so important. So it's, it's a kind of writing and it's a kind of reading where you're able to look at the icon and you, you see much more than um, just like a, um, how can I put it, like a, a simple illustration. One thing that I'll point out um, that you see, generally speaking, in icons of the Lord and of the saints, and um, I think this, this one here of the Mother of God is a good example. But, you know, they don't always, uh, it's not always kind of clear to see, but generally speaking, in iconography, I can get this back on the wall. <clears throat> the eyes are large and the mouth is small. And here's an example of something that it's not meant to be realistic. Like, like maybe that's not exactly how they looked if you took a photograph of them, but it's telling you something spiritual about their life. That they were watchful, you know, always. And, and you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They were pure in heart, their eyes were opened, and they beheld the mysteries of God, right? That, the, the, big, the large eyes are telling you that. And the mouth was small <laughs> because they didn't speak with idle words. Okay? They didn't speak unnecessarily. Their mouths were 
you know, closed to any kind of um, sinful speech. Does that make sense? So, so it's telling you the, the features themselves are, are meant to be, they're, they're more symbolic than they are realistic. And you see that a lot. I mean, where, like, you look at this one of the Mother of God. Well, that doesn't look like a very realistic face. And sometimes people say, well, it was just primitive art. Actually, no, a lot of the earliest Christian art was very realistic. It looked like um, Renaissance art, you know, like the features, almost photographic. If you look in the um, fifth and sixth centuries, a lot of those ones were like that. But gradually, they became more stylized and less photographic or realistic because they were making these theological statements so that people could look at them and learn from them. <clears throat> So there's a lot more that we could say about how iconography is done, but the point that I wanted to make really was that iconography um, fits with all the other um, uh, sort of written deposits of our tradition that are handed down from generation to generation, beginning with scripture and then including all of these other things that I've mentioned. Now, what about um, the sort of the perm permissibility of having icons in the church? And here, you know, something interesting took place, which was that there were no sort of, at least publicly on a big scale that we know of, no major objections to having iconography in the church for the first six centuries. Um, actually, seven, first seven centuries. And then about the, around the beginning of the eighth century, there started to be objections. It's interesting because um, historically that sort of uh, the beginning of what we call iconoclasm when people started to object to using icons in the church came not long after uh, the beginning of Islam. So you have uh, Muhammad and then um, shortly after Muhammad, Islam begins to spread in places like North Africa and um, the Middle East, and it's starting to, you have the Byzantine Empire, which is basically the Christian world at that time, but little by little, um, the, the Byzantine Empire is being attacked and invaded, um, and, and so you start to have this tension between Christianity and Islam that's developing. And so not long after that is when this iconoclasm begins to develop, and um, so at least one theory is that it was influenced by Islam, because in Islam, of course, you can't you can't have any kind of image, that only you can use abstract art, you know. Um, but, uh, of course, people began to, to um, connect this with, uh, the, in the Ten Commandments, you know, the, the commandment, thou shalt have no graven image, right? Um, and so there's this whole um, question about whether iconography constitutes idolatry. So this is really the issue, right? Is this an idol? Is this a graven image in the sense of an idol that can be worshipped and all of this kind of thing? Um, and so the question is, what does, what's the purpose of that commandment? Um, and and um, sort of what's the spirit behind it? And does iconography violate that? So uh, something important to keep in mind is that in the Old Testament, and really prior to the incarnation of Christ, um, a very important point is that God cannot be seen, period. He's invisible. And so um, there's no way you can depict him, you know? He's not depictable. You can't, there's no form that he takes. So any attempt on the part of human beings to try to depict him would inevitably, inevitably lead to idolatry. Because how do they depict him? Well, they imagine maybe he's like an animal, or like a tree, or whatever. Whatever it may be, even if it's a human form, it, it, it turns into idolatry. So, um, so, so God for, forbade uh, the Jews, his people, to make any kind of an image um, because clearly that was leading to idolatry. However, Interestingly, if you read in, in the Old Testament, in the law, and, and uh, sort of the directions for um, establishing the tabernacle and everything that's all the appointments for the tabernacle and the temple, 
God, after, right after saying, Thou shalt not make any graven image, He tells them to make certain images. It seems like a contradiction. But what He says is, for example, um, you have the Ark of the Covenant, and then the Mercy Seat, which goes on top of that, and then there are two images of cherubim that they're supposed to carve to go on top of the Mercy Seat. And that's commanded by God. And so you have these images of cherubim that are, that are all around and other things that are to be carved or depicted in the temple, um, pomegranates and things like that. Well, so what's going on here? Is God contradicting himself? Don't make any image, and then he tells them to make images. What do you think? <laughs> no contradiction. Why? Because clearly um, when, when you're making images of cherubim and it's commanded by God, um, these are, are referencing the glory of God rather than leading away from it. And that's the difference. An idol is something that leads you from God and causes you to worship something else. But when it's an image that leads you to God, as it were, like through the image you come to God, then it's not idolatrous. In other words, if it gives glory to God, and, and if it inspires people to worship God and to come humbly before Him in worship, then it's not idolatrous. And so these cherubim were telling the people, God is present. They were a sign that God was there. Why? Because what do cherubim do? They accompany God wherever He goes. So you see the ark and there are the cherubim. You, you know, God is here. He's on His throne. The, the, the mercy seat, that's where He is. He's present here. Even though we can't see Him, we know He's here because we see the cherubim. So that's the idea. And um, so you have Isaiah uh, in chapter 6. He has the vision of God in glory. He's on his throne in his throne room. And you have cherubim and seraphim and all of these things. So that's what um, these cherubim are, are kind of um, images of, that, that picture of God in his glory. So, um, so this, is, this is the thing. And here's the difference between idolatry and um, an image that is blessed by God and even commanded by God. Um, however, in the Old Testament, God Himself was invisible. And any time um, you have God somehow appearing uh, to people, there is the sense that if you saw God, you would die. Right? So this is kind of Mo the way Moses expresses himself and other prophets. They say, you know, behold, you know, I'm dust and ashes and I've beheld God and now I can't live. You know, and they fall on the ground. And that's the idea that the Jews had was that it was impossible and, and if you somehow did see God, you would die. Um, and there's this language like with Moses when he uh, beholds God. And God says, you can't see my face and live but I'll let you see my back, you know? And it's kind of like, uh, what does that mean, seeing God's back? It's not literally His back, but what, what it means is like, he's, he's revealing His glory in a mitigated form, because you can't see it all, you, you know, you can't bear it, you know? But to a certain extent, I will allow you to behold my glory. Um, so, so this is the thing. But, what happens in the Incarnation? The, the Word becomes flesh, right? God, Jesus Christ, what does it say in, in uh, John's Gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth, right? So, in the Incarnation, and the Incarnation, of course, means the becoming flesh, when the Word became flesh, and God became man. In that event, everything changes everything changes. I mean, this is the central reality for us as Christians, is that God didn't just stay up there in the heaven and say, you know, too bad for you sinners, you're all going to hell, you know. No, He came into our midst to deliver us. And, and He did it by humbling Himself and becoming one of us. It's like inconceivable to most non-Christians. And that's, I mean, that's the scandal. It scandalizes Jews. It scandalizes Muslims. It scandalized the Greek pagans. They said, God can't become a human being. You know? It was a scandal. It was a stumbling block. But for Christians, <clears throat> that's the central reality, that God loves us that much, that He became one of us, right? So, because that took place, that changes everything when it comes to God's being invisible. He's not invisible anymore. Remember when the Apostles, it says in the Gospel, 
after the Lord has been with the uh, disciples and he's been ministering to them, they don't quite get it yet. And so they come to him and they say, Lord, show us the Father and then we'll be happy. You know, show us the Father. We want to see the Father. And he says, have I been with you so long and you don't understand? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's like the face of the Father for us. He's the face of God for us. Now, we still make a distinction. The Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Father. You know, just like you're, n you're not Jacob, Jacob's not you. You know, you're, you're um, separate persons, but you're united, you know, through your familial ties, and it's the same in God. There's one divine essence, you know, one God, but there's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we don't say that Jesus is the Father. That would be a heresy. That would be a false teaching. But we say that through Jesus, we behold God. We see the Father. We can know the Father through Him you know, because they're united. Um, so what does that mean? In Christ, we see God. And if God has become flesh and blood and material, and you could take a photograph of God, then we no longer have the situation where God cannot be seen or else you'll die and you know you can't depict Him. So um, you can depict God because you can depict Jesus Christ. And this is, and so the church said not only can you depict Him, but we must, you know, we, we must because that's a reminder to us all the time. When you have an icon of Christ in your home, every time you see it, at least you should think, this is a sign of God's love. This is a reminder to me of God's love, that God became human, that He became flesh and blood and concrete so that I could touch Him. So, that, you know, we wouldn't be just sort of separated, but we would be concretely connected with each other, you know. Um, so this is a beautiful thing. Okay, and um, just going through my notes to see where I am. Yeah, um, so icons, rather than being idols, are records bearing witness to the reality of God's love. Okay, you see the difference. Now, could they be treated like idols? Sure. We can treat anything like an idol. We can treat our family members as idols. We can treat the Bible as an idol. We can treat, you know, the church as an, we can make idols of all kinds of things. It's an idol when that becomes the object of our worship instead of God. So anything that can be done. To, so just because it could be sort of distorted and used for the wrong purpose doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. If we say that, then we have to get rid of everything, you know. And our family members, and you know, like not have, just live in a vacuum or something. Well, we can't do that. Um, and it's good, you know. Same thing about we could say for scripture. Well, scripture could be an idol, so we don't get rid of it. We just say, don't make it an idol. Um, but rather, it bears witness. It's not God, but it bears witness to God. It points to God. So scripture does that. And icons do that. And everything in the life of the church is meant to do that. We don't worship anything but God. Um, but the icon is not um, a, a god or an idol, but it's pointing to God. So what we say is, the icon is like a window through which we behold the kingdom of heaven, through which we can behold God and the saints and th these eternal realities. Or um, another image, window is one image, another image is a reflection. Um, you know, like if you're looking at a mirror or you're looking in water and you see there the reflection of what's up above, like you look in a lake and you see the sky reflected there. Well, um, the point is that uh, for us to see the reflection, that's a reminder to us that the sky is really there. You know, you don't if you if you sort of blocked off the sky and it wasn't uh, present anymore, you wouldn't see the reflection anymore. Um, so, what that's doing for us is it's telling us the icon is telling us that not that it's representing something that's not present or that's not real, you know, uh, like, I don't know, something out of our imagination, but that it's a reminder to us of what is present and what is real. 
So when we see the icon of Christ, we shouldn't think like Jesus is somewhere up there and this is a nice picture reminding us that he's somewhere up there. We should say, Jesus is in this room, just like that icon's in this room, and that icon's telling us that he's here. It's a reminder to us that he's present. Um, it's like saying to us, here I am, I'm with you. And this is why we like to put icons of saints all around us, because it's a reminder to us of the great cloud of witnesses, that we have these saints that are always surrounding us, they're always praying for us, they're always interceding for us, and they're serving as examples to us. And um, in our life as Christians, we're not separate from them. We're united. Okay. So God loved us so much that He became one of us. The Word and Son of the Father came into the world to save us, and that reality makes icons possible. Every icon is like a trophy, we could say, proclaiming this glorious truth of the Incarnation. And um, one of my favorite quotations about icons is from St. John of Damascus, who was one of the fathers of the Church, who lived during that early uh, period of iconoclasm when, when some people were um, attacking the icons, saying that we needed to get rid of them from the church, saying that they were idolatrous and all of these things. St. John of Damascus um, wrote uh, some beautiful um, treatises on icons explaining their purpose and their meaning and defending them. And he says this, The icon is a song of triumph and a revelation and an enduring monument to the victory of the saints and the disgrace of the demons. So it's like, the icon is like a, a trophy um, which reminds us of Christ's victory over evil. And by the way, um, another connection with the Incarnation. A lot of times, as even as Christians, but really this idea comes from um, pre-Christian paganism but it's, it kind of creeps into our faith sometimes. A lot of times we have this idea that like material things are evil. And this is really what we call Gnosticism, because the Gnostic heresies, um, which were influenced by um, like Platonism, the Plato, the Greek philosopher, and a lot of those related ideas. But Gnosticism said that um, basically, you know, spiritual realities are good, material things are evil. So it's what's called du dualism, you know? You separate the physical and the, sp and the material from the spiritual. So for example, our souls are good, but our bodies are evil. That's the idea. That's not Christian at all. Because, I mean, it, it's not scriptural. What did God create? Everything good, right? So he made, he made human beings, body and soul. And then he said, it's very good. God created everything good in the beginning. Um, so it's not the case that matter is evil. However, human beings have p often put matter to an evil use, and that's the problem. It's not that matter is evil, but that we use it for evil, right? It's the same with anything. Um, we use what God gives us for evil, you know? So, you know, God created water good, um, but then we, we misuse it. We pollute it. I don't know, we drown people, and you know, all kinds of terrible things. It becomes a vehicle for evil. All kinds of things in the world are like that. But in the life of the Church, um, and, and this is connected back to the Incarnation, everything is about taking that which God created good in the beginning, but has been polluted or used for evil somehow and become distorted and twisted, and by God's grace, restoring it to its original purpose and making it good again. So that's what we do when we bless water, when we have holy water. We're not turning water into something that it's not. We are offering it back up to God so that He can restore it to its original purpose that He created it for, which is to be a blessing. You see? So everything, all, all of matter, all of the world, is being restored to what God created it for. And so um, icons are reminders to us that in Christ, matter is restored to its original good purpose. So, um, the icon itself, which is a physical thing, we say that's a reminder to us that God, uh, in, in Jesus Christ, has taken matter, God has become flesh, and is res by doing that, He's restored matter to its goodness, to its original created goodness. 
So we don't worship matter as matter. We worship God. But we, we praise God and glorify Him and give thanks to Him through matter. We can't do it any other way because we're, we're matter, you know? So we do it with our bodies and we, we do it um, by, by material means. And again, I always like to use the analogy of human relationships, you know? Again, I could, I, could, um, I could tell my wife that I love her, but if I never gave her a hug, she might not believe it, you know? I could say, I love you, but I don't want to touch you. <laughs> Just, you know, don't get too close to me. <laughs> she would have a problem with that, you know? Because that's not how it works for human beings. We, we're material, and so we, we, we demonstrate our love in a material way. So, it's, so we say, of course we sh we're supposed to love God in our hearts, but how we use our body demonstrates our love for Him. You know, if we're um, seeking His will and following His commandments for how we should treat our bodies, then that's a way of showing that we love Him. And if we, you know, bow in prayer and make the sign of the cross and raise our hands or, you know, do these kind of physical things, those things matter because matter matters. And, and because we're physical. And it's what we call incarnational. Jesus Christ became incarnate, and so that means that our, our matter and the matter in the world can then be used to glorify God. Rather than leading away from God, it leads us to God, you see? So in Christianity, in our faith, everything is restored to its original purpose. So icons are an example of physical matter, that wood and that paint and whatever goes into making that icon, being restored to a purpose that glorifies God. I hope I'm making the point clearly enough that, that it's, it's all not leading away from God, but it's glorifying God. It's a really important point because it's not only true of icons, but this is something that touches on basically our whole life as human beings. Um, and it also touches on sacraments, the sacramental life, the fact that we use bread and wine and water and oil and all of these things. The, the Orthodox Church is very sacramental. And what that means is that we use, God uses, we should say, physical things, just like in the Incarnation in Christ, He uses physical things to give us His grace, to bless us. And we use, it's, a, it's like a dance, you know, we both have our, our part in the dance. God blesses us with these things, and then we take them and we offer them back to Him, and then He receives them from us and gives them back to us in a transformed way. Right? So bread. You know, God blesses us with wheat. And we make it into bread, and then we bring it to church, and we offer it to Him. And then He gives it back to us as His body. And wine. You know, He blesses us with grapes. We can have wine. We can make wine. But it's not just to get drunk, you know. It's not to get drunk at all. But it's to bring, you know, to glorify Him, you know. So we bring the wine to the church, and we offer it to Him, and then He gives it back to us as His blood and oil. You know, we can go through all of these things that are used within the sacraments of the church and um, talk about how they, they, they do the same thing. They are material means by which God conveys His grace to us. I've spoken about how um, there's a canonical or traditional way of making icons, writing them. Um, and, and I'll just mention here um, there are plenty of images out there that portray the Lord and the saints, um, and maybe they do it somewhat like icons, or maybe not at all like on icons, but they don't follow the traditions. And so these, we would say, are, are not canonical icons. And it would be kind of like, um, I don't know, if you just have a, a really uh, sort of inaccurate translation of Scripture, or may maybe even something that you know somebody wrote about Jesus, which is nice. You know, it's like a nice little book about Jesus or something. But it's not the scripture. It's not the same thing. It's not as trustworthy. You know, it's not as accurate in, in um, what it's teaching you. And so we'd say the same thing. You know, they're, they're, you know, I don't know. Um, I like Michelangelo. You know. <laughs> The, the Renaissance art and all kinds of things and, you know, sort of modern things that people have done. And it's fine, but it's not the same as iconography. So we make a distinction. And traditionally, um, iconographers 
have a whole process that they go through. You know, it's supposed to be done with prayer. It's supposed to be done with you know fasting, with preparing yourself, um, so that it's really a prayerful process that glorifies God from start to finish. Now, practically speaking, it's traditional for people to put icons in their home, um, and especially in places where you would say your prayers. So a lot of times uh, families will have one spot in their home which is a prayer corner or a prayer wall or something like that. It's useful to have a table or a, a shelf or something where you can put your prayer book or you know, whatever you want to have, a candle if you want that. And people will put icons there. We use icons for prayer um, and, you know, I spoke about one purpose for them, which is to teach, to instruct. I spoke about another purpose, which is to, uh, as um, a reminder to us of God's presence, that we see the icon and we know that Christ is present, or we know the saints are present. Um, it also it just helps us, practically speaking, when we pray to focus. That's why we have icons in the front of the church. Um, you know, the iconostasis, as I mentioned when I did the tour, it's something that developed over time. You just began with like a little lower, uh, kind of a, a lower altar rail type of thing and maybe a few icons, and then it just grew historically. And one of the reasons for that was that, practically speaking, people found it distracting to see like the altar boys doing whatever they were doing, you know. Um, and uh, so instead of that, it was better to have icons that would help people to focus and to remind them why we're here. It's not just to be entertained. It's not just to kind of see what little Johnny's doing over here, you know. It's for Christ, and it's to become saints. So we have Christ, and we have the Theotokos, and we have the saints, and we're constantly reminded of that. And I always say, I need that. I don't know about y'all, but I need a constant reminder because my mind wanders like nobody's business. It's just like all over the place, right? It's like, if, if I don't foc have something to help me focus, that's what will happen. But when I get in my prayer corner, I mean, I still have to struggle with it. But, you know, you, you see the icon, you're looking in Christ's eyes, and you see Him looking at you, you know? And you know that it's not the icon, but that He's really there looking at you. And, and so your mind wanders and you say, no, I'm, I'm standing here with Christ. I'm standing here in the presence of the saints, you know? This is why I'm here. It's not to think about what I'm going to do later, my, my to-do list, or what I have to go to the store and shop for, or whatever. It's not any of that, but it's, it's for this purpose to glorify God, to worship Him, and to be with Him, to spend time with Him. So they serve that very practical purpose as well. So we, have, we, we put icons in our icon corner to help us to focus in prayer. Um, and, and they're wonderful for children. You know, children really connect. Because children want to use their senses. So, I mean, it's the worst thing you can do to just put them in a, a room with white walls and, you know, there's nothing to kind of connect with sensorial, sen like in their senses, however you say that. Um, so, uh, this is what we have in the church. We, you know, we connect visually and we connect through what we hear and we connect through what we smell, the incense and so on, and what we taste and what we feel. Um, so the, the worship of the church connects with all five senses. It's traditional to have icons blessed in the church. A lot of times when people buy them from online or whatever, they'll bring them and we'll bless them in the church. Um, traditionally, people don't put them in bathrooms, but in any other room in the house. It's kind of um, the, the custom. They should be uh, treated reverently, of course, respectfully, because again, they represent the Lord and the saints. It's kind of like, um, as Americans, we, we you know, Icons might be foreign, but we understand about the flag, you know? Like, what we do with the flag matters, right, if you're uh, patriotic, right? You're not going to take the flag and put it on the ground and walk on it, you know? There's a whole, I mean, if, if you ever, you know, were involved in scouts or anything like that, military, you know, there's a whole right way of doing things, how you fold the flag, how, how it's not supposed to touch anything when it's hanging. How even at night, you know, you're not supposed to leave it just hanging at night unless there's a light shining on it or in the rain or all of these things, right? So we have this whole flag code that's telling us how to treat the flag respectfully. Why? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? You know, it's just a, it's just a flag, right? Well, it matters because it's a symbol of our love for our country. 
you know, and of our loyalty to our country, and that we take that seriously, and so on, that we're not uh, somehow going to betray our country. Well, um, likewise, and all the more so, with an image of the Lord, you know, you're not going to just treat it disrespectfully, right? And again, it's not, it's not so much that I love the flag, but I, I would be respectful to the flag because of what it symbolizes, right? It's, it's not that we worship the icon, but that the icon is a reminder to us of Christ's presence. So it's a way of saying, I love Christ when we kiss the icon. And I often will use the example of, um, that at least most people can relate to, of if you have a, a picture of your loved one, and let's say you're serving in the military or something, or you're on a long trip, and you can't see your husband or your wife for a long time, and that you have that picture in your wallet, and you know, you're really missing that person. And let's say you pull the picture out, and you're looking at it, and you know, longingly thinking of your loved one, and then you kiss the picture. You know? Does that seem kind of like a natural thing to do? It does for me, you know, like... And, and so, um, but it's, it's not that I love the picture. I mean, I love the picture, but I love the picture because I love the person that's depicted in the picture. Does that make sense? So, so it's not really the picture that's the object of my love, but the person depicted. But the kiss is like a way of saying, I love that person. And, you know, that's, that's something that I think is uh, beautiful and meaningful, even in the case of our loved one whose picture we kiss. But if I were traveling, my wife wouldn't know, I don't think, that I kissed her picture, right? We say, the Lord certainly knows. So it's even more meaningful because he's actually receiving that kiss. You know, he's knowing as we're doing it that we're doing it. Um, and the saints, likewise, because we say they're alive in Christ. So they're aware that we're, we're saying, I love you. You know, I'm thankful for you. I, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, um, I'm grateful to God for you and so on. So this is why we, we reverence them, we, and we kiss them, and we treat them respectfully. Um, You know, old. If if an icon becomes um, uh, somehow it, it gets ruined or something like that, um, we wouldn't just throw it in the garbage. Um, and I actually have a problem with you know we we um, a lot of times in magazines and um, advertisements and things like that people are printing color icons, and then where does that go? In the garbage. I don't like that. I don't think they should you know, at least make it black and white or something like that, you know, not like a, a color icon, which um, it's more like a real icon, you know, even if it's printed. So I think um, we should just be careful about, um, you know, what we're doing with that. And um, what we do is, uh, the way we deal with that, if, if an icon is sort of ruined somehow or something like that, um, it can be buried or it can be burned with the other the holy things in the church, like if we have um, holy oil that spills and we wipe it up or something like that with a paper towel, we'll burn it. Um, and then we take the ashes and we bury them. So it's like even treating that respectfully. Again, it's kind of like the flag. If you have an old flag that's tattered or whatever, there's a way that you can respectfully burn it and bury, bury the, the ashes. Um, so it's, it's to, do, to treat it in an honorable way, even if it becomes ruined and we, we need to dispose of it somehow. We should remember when we see the icons, and this is the last thing that I'll, I'll say about them right now, that we're called to be icons too. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, at the beginning of Genesis when it says, you know, God created um, all the world and then it, it talks about human beings, it says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness, right? This is the language in Genesis. And that word, image, that's translated as image in English, is icon. If you read in the Greek text of the Old Testament, it's ikon, icon, icon. Let us make man as our icon. That's what it is. So human beings are icons of God. And, and this is connected to the fact that we're supposed to treat each other respectfully, right? How we treat the icons, and, and here's a, I think this is another very important connection. A lot of us have trouble treating each other respectfully, honorably. 
with reverence, with love, you know, seeing the image of Christ in each person, right? But if, even beginning as children, but even, you know, it's not too late as adults to start learning, we can, we can learn how to be reverent in, in how we treat icons and how we treat things in the life of the church. That's training us, ideally, to actually treat everybody and every, all of God's creation more respectfully. Um, so we're supposed to try to see each other as icons of God. And if we, you know, we're supposed to be reverent towards the icons that are in the church, we're supposed to be reverent towards each other as well. Um, and I always point out that, uh, you know, like on Forgiveness Sunday, uh, before Lent begins in the spring, we have um, this, the service of forgiveness where we make a bow before each other. Just like we do when we kiss icon, you know, we make a bow and we kiss it. We do the same thing with each other. And I always encourage married couples to do the same thing. Like, it feels awkward at first when you're not used to doing that. But actually, to, to do something physical, to say, you know, I'm humbling myself before you and I know that I've offended you and I'm asking you for forgiveness. Like a prostration or a bow or something, you know, to say, like, I'm not, I'm not worthy of your love, but I ask you to, to forgive me for the ways that I've treated you and, and so on. It's a, it's a good habit to get into. Um, but this is what icons are, are training us to do. God created us to be icons of Him, and when we see icons, we're gazing uh, through windows into the heavenly realm, and icons are reminding us that that's where we're headed. They're, they're reminding us of heavenly realities. It's our true home, and every icon is a reminder of God's love. Now, questions about icons. How is it decided what goes where? I know that's Christ, a good question. Christ and, and the tokens, but the rest of them. Yeah, that's a good question. So, right, you mentioned um, you have the two icons that are always on the, the left and the right of the holy doors, and those are the first and second coming, you know, or the, the virgin with the child and Christ, the, the, the Pantocrat, or the ruler of all. Um, usually over the holy doors is the icon of the mystical supper, the Christ with his disciples. Um, and then um, to the left of the Theotokos is the patron, patronal icon of the church. So in ours it's St. Nicholas, because we're St. Nicholas. If you go to Holy Nativity, it'll be the icon of the Nativity of Christ, the birth of Christ, because that's their patronal feast. So that'll be there. And then to the right of the icon of Christ is uh, St. John the Baptist. And he's somehow pointing, usually, you know, kind of bowing towards Christ or pointing to him because that was his role as the forerunner to point the way to Christ. And then um, to the right and left of, uh, to the right of uh, St. John the Baptist and to the left of the patronal icon, um, in our case, we have the deacon's doors. Um, sometimes you might have another icon before the deacon's doors, but somewhere around there the doors will be. And on the doors you'll have either angels, the archangels like in ours, Michael and uh, Gabriel, or uh, deacons, deacon saints like Stephen, you know, who's first deacon in the church. Um, so he might be one and then some other deacon saint. Um, and then you might have the angels, you know, beside that or before that or whatever. And then after that, it's just icons that the church chooses, the community, that are somehow important to the community. So we have particular ones that the people chose because they had a special veneration for those. For example, we have St. Raphael of Brooklyn, who's an American, um, Lebanese, Syrian saint, you know. Um, so some of our, in, actually came to Shreveport, 1914. So yeah, so there are particular reasons why those are chosen, but it's not sort of dictated. But then, in the, then you have rows above that, and you could have up to four rows in some churches, depending on the design of the iconostasis and everything like that. We only have one additional row, and so we have the apostles up above there. Some churches will have a row of apostles, and they'll have a row of feast days, all the feast days of the church up there. We don't have them up there. We have them around the perimeter of the church, the feast days. So, yeah, there's a whole kind of order to how that's done. And usually when people have their icons in their homes, they do kind of like a similar, you know, like Lord on the right and the Theotokos on the left. It's just a 
traditional customary way of doing it. But it's, there's not kind of a strict way it has to be done in your home. It all depends on what you have, how many icons, you know. And, uh, and, and so, to some degree it's just your personal piety when, in, when it comes to your home. Um, okay, I have. I wanted to share this. Some of you may have read this before. It's the it's the booklet that we have uh, called "No Graven Image," and um, you know we have copies out in the Narthex. And so you may have taken that before and looked at it. Um, but this it it goes through a lot of what I already shared and um, maybe prevent, presents some additional. Um, ideas or thoughts about icons that you might find helpful. So please read through that when you get a chance. Um, and uh, one thing that this talks about that I didn't mention, um, I, I just, I sort of briefly alluded to the period of uh, iconoclasm that began in, at the beginning of the 8th century, the early 700s. But if you turn to page 7, towards the end of this, it talks about um, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And that Seventh Ecumenical Council in 8787 um, decided uh, definitively that icons were permissible in the life of the church. And so there's this statement here, and I'll just read that. It says, We therefore, following the royal pathway and the divinely inspired authority of our Holy Fathers and the traditions of the church, for as we all know, the Holy Spirit indwells her, define with all certainty and accuracy that just as the figure of the precious and life-giving cross, so also the venerable and holy images, as well in painting and mosaic as of other fit materials, should be set forth in the holy churches of God and on the sacred vessels and on the vestments and on hangings and in pictures both in houses and by the wayside. By the wayside is referring to like shrines that people will have even outside. Like we have a, a couple of these icon shrines outside of it. Just places where, if you go to Greece, you see a lot of these where you're just like going along and along the side of the road, there's an icon because, you know, people want to um, always be reminded of God's love wherever they go. So in, traditionally in Orthodox countries, you see that kind of thing. Um, publicly even. So, uh, to wit, the figure of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, of our spotless Lady, of the honorable angels, of all saints, and of all pious people. For by so much more frequently as they are seen in artistic representation, by so much more readily are people lifted up to the memory of their prototypes. So, the more we see them, the more we, we're reminded uh, of God and of His love, and to a longing after them. And to these should be given due salutation and honorable reverence, not indeed that true worship of faith which pertains alone to the divine nature, right? We only worship God, that's what that's saying. So not worship of faith which only pertains to God, but to these, the icons, as to the figure of the precious and life-giving cross and to the book of the Gospels and to the other holy objects, incense and lights may be offered according to ancient pious custom. So in other words, the incense and the lights and the kissing and the bows and everything that we do is just a way of saying, we love you. They're like gifts that we're bringing um, to the Lord, to our, our older um, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters in the faith, and just saying, um, thank you for your prayers and your love, and, and uh, thank you to God for His mercy. For the honor which is paid to the image passes on to that which the image represents, and he who reveres the image reveres in it the subject represented. Thus the icon is a true image, a window to heaven, and a light which guides us there. In that sense, it takes the same role as the pillar of fire which guided Israel through the wilderness to the promised land, and the star which led the wise men to Christ. The icon is not intended to serve as a photograph of an earthly scene, nor does it merely awaken in us the sense of ages past. Rather, the icon is there to lead our hearts to the King of Kings, to the brilliant glory of the age to come. And then that last paragraph, the icon is a holy image, a door to heaven. It tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ and his great cloud of witnesses are present, on hand, on high with us. Therefore, it is indispensable for those who sincerely pursue and desire the fullness of Christian worship. What icon is the gospel on the Gospel book, on one side is the resurrection of Christ, and on the other side is the crucifixion. And the way we do it is um, 
in on the holy table, we have it on turned so that the image of the crucifixion is showing Monday through Saturday, and then for Sunday we turn it over to the resurrection because Sunday is the day of the resurrection. So on Sunday, we have it, and so yeah. So on Sundays, when we process with it, when we bless with it, you know, the deacon or the priest has the resurrection facing the people. And on every other day, if we have liturgy on any other day of the week, it'll be the cross side, showing. So when we kiss the gospel, we're kissing the resurrection. Kissing the resurrection, yeah. You're, so you're, you're giving thanks for the resurrection when you, when you kiss that, as well as for the gospel. True. Yeah. Any other questions? Or comments, complaints, thoughts, <laughs> considerations? All right. Let's end with a prayer.